Okay, thank you, Lisa. Yeah, so this is going to be the last part of the lecture. I will start by giving you some brief overview of Duralian. I would like to focus more on the physics part of it. You will see that I will have a detailed calculation at next reading order for Julian. The slides will be there. I will just, I won't go in any detail through them. You can work on them um, at your convenience later on. Uh, I will just focus on the physics part and then I want to touch near the end on some kind of very over brief overview of some methods for NNLO calculations. Since some people yesterday asked me to show a list of you know what's going on. Okay, so let's start with with Julian. So the reason we are talking about Julian here is that yeah, we started with the with with no headers in the initial state. That was E plus E minus two hadrons. We saw what issues we get there, infra singularities that appear in the final state. We moved to the single hadronic initial state through DIS. We saw that we had to deal with something new, which is initial state collinear singularities. We saw what we did with them. We had to absorb them into the PDFs. Now we move to two hadronic initial states. And this is, for example, a case that applies to the LHC. OK, so what is Drillian? So Drillian is the production of a, lep a lepton pair in the S channel. And you could do that in multiple ways. You could be colliding a proton-proton beam, a proton-antiproton beam, or a proton um, nuclear nucleus um, case. So that means you could have either two beams or a beam on a fixed target. Okay. And so you could be producing leptons in your final state through the production of an off-shell photon, or a Z, or a W. All of those are standard model particles. But you could also be producing new physics particles, like Z prime and W prime. So such particles, you could search for them through Dridian. <coughs> and actually, what you can see from this plot at the bottom, by studying the dimion invariant mass through orders of magnitude, several orders of magnitude, we have been able to actually discover many resonances in the Drillian process. The Z, for example, the Z boson was discovered in Drillian. The J psi and the Opsilon, they were discovered <coughs> in Drillian. So many discoveries were made in this process. It's a very, very important process, as you will see over time as I show you more slides. So facts about Drillian, these are important facts. Why, there is, why we were we able to make so many discoveries in this particular process? First, it has a, s a clean signal at hadron colliders because the lepton pairs do not interact strongly. And like cases where you have jets, for example. It's one of the best theoretically studied processes at hadron colliders. The precision we have today is really impressive on the theory side and equally on the experimental side. So uncertainties on both sides are at a few percent level. Factorization here has been proved to all orders in QCD perturbation theory. Again, this is an important statement. N factorization is not proved to all orders for everything. We don't have the general proof. It has been proved for some processes. For other processes, we think it still should hold. Uh, for Drian, it has been proved by Colin Soper Sturman. And it's standard candle for detector calibration. For example, you look at detector response to lepton energy. So it's, this is why it's one of those um, interesting processes we keep studying. Now I want to show you some, we'll go back in history, I want to show you some of the interesting facts we have learned through Julian. So it's, as I say here, it has helped to uh, establish QCD as a quantitative theory. So in 1979, there was a comparison of dimion invariant <coughs> mass um, that was done, that was measured at a very old experiment, NA3 at, at CERN. So this is really a very old one. Uh, proton nucleus experiment. You can see it was at 200 uh, GeV center of mass energy. The data are shown here in this black dot. And the theory prediction was back then a leading order cross section. It's shown here in a solid black line. And you can immediately see that our prediction was totally off from the data. And so what experimentalists uh, did, so this CDHS is just referring to some old PDF parameterization. You don't need to focus on it. What they said is that if they multiply our prediction by a constant factor of 2.2, then the prediction agrees with data. <coughs> so this was actually the first time the notion of a K factor was introduced to describe a distribution between data and theory. So clearly, since leading order did not agree, what happens if you look at next leading order? This is the work that back then Altarelli, Alice Martinelli, have done in 1979. So they looked at uh, NRO QCD corrections. It's not the prettiest pro plot here. So what is shown on the vertical axis is the NLO correction normalized to the leading order cross-section. 
they show you what they get from the various channels, the quark gluon and the quark anti-quark channel, which here they split into two pieces. A piece that is proportional to the tree level and a piece that is not proportional to the tree level. The important line in here is this solid one that they refer to as total. So it's the sum of all the channels. And they see that this N and O corrections shift the K factor between 0.8 to 1. So it adds all these corrections between 80% to 100%. So when you add your leading auto cross section to this shift, you get a total of roughly 2, 2 times the tree level cross section. And that roughly explains that discrepancy that we have seen between theory and data. And this was one of the best examples that have established QCD as a quantitative theory. You can really use it to explain discrepancies between theory and data. And then over time, it has become clear that pure NLO alone is not enough. You need to go even to next to next reading order. So this is an old plot. It's from 2003. I'm showing it because I want to reflect a particular point here. So this is your leading order. This is your next leading order in green. You can see that the NNLO give an additional shift, gives an additional shift, but we have here two NNLO predictions. And they come from using two PDF sets. So you can see here that if you don't have a good knowledge of PDFs, you are going to get two different or multiple predictions. Not all of them necessarily agree very good with data. For example, the pink one from the uh, using a different PDF set agrees better than the red one. So this Drillian data can actually help you understand the PDFs or constrain the PDFs in a better way. So Drillian was also a place, as I said, where we made multiple discoveries. One of them is the epsilon resonance. So this is the daimyon invariant mass steel. The epsilon was discovered in 1977 at the Fermilab experiment. E288 was the name of it. And this was practically the observation of the B quark, or the discovery of the B quark, because epsilon is a bound state of a BB bar pair. Dridian was also the process where we have seen the Z boson. So this was at the UA1, UA2 uh, experiment at CERN, 1983. Uh, by studying the leptonic invariant mass, we have been able to see the Z boson. Later, they also discovered the W boson. And uh, the discovery of the Z was awarded the Nobel Prize back then because this has helped establish the standard model itself. There are also famous cases or examples of non-discoveries. So this is an example that uh, shows uh, one of those. So this was a search for jet plus missing energy. Um, you are looking here at the missing energy squared. If you look at the top part, they show the missing energy without squaring it. So for the backgrounds for such a final state come from multiple sources. The ones that the experimentalists back then have considered come from the ones shown uh, here. One of them is so-called uh, jet fluctuations. Namely, if you mismeasure a jet, you have jets and you mismeasure some of them, you have something that looks like jets plus missing energy. The second background they have considered was uh, where the, the case where the W decays into tau and neutrino and the tau decays hadronically. So this one is a smaller background than the jet fluctuation one. Of course, there are other backgrounds as well, like Z plus jet and W plus jet. And those are not even on the plot. And we will see why. So they assume that all the major background is coming from these two sources here. And they noticed that far away from the background region, they were able to me measure events that could not be explained within the standard model. So this was the conclusion of, of the, the work back then. So what they said, we have presented a sample of five single jet events and two photon events, which we don't see here on the plot, in fact, with a, a missing energy that is greater than 40 GeV. Because if you look here, that's the region where we have no background. So this is totally background free. We have been unable to find a reasonable explanation in terms of background, including W and Z decays, or within the explanation of the standard model. Therefore, we believe they are due to some new physics phenomena. So we thought back then that we discovered some new physics effects. This was in 1984. And then papers started to appear, as usually. <laughs> so this is a paper by John Ellis, Hopes Grow for Supersymmetry, 1985. High energy collisions between pro protons and antiprotons produce strange events in which momentum fails to balance. Missing momentum may be carried by Fotino, super partners, or the, the, the photon. So we thought that we have seen Susie. That was 1984. 
we are still searching for Susie. So what went wrong in there? As I said, there, there were other backgrounds that were not on that plot. Why? You have backgrounds from W plus jets and Z plus jet. They were back then modeled with parton shower. Parton showers back then did not have any matching to hard matrix elements. So the assumption is that your radiation is not hard when you use the pattern shower. So you ask yourself, for this particular experiment, was the radiation soft, collinear, or hard? The center of mass energy for this experiment, the UA1, was 540 GeV. We are talking ab about missing energy of 40 GeV, so the jets are recording against 40 GeV. 40 GeV here, with respect to 540, is hard. That's not soft which means modeling this with a pattern shower was not correct. And that's why they thought this is a negligible background. They did not get the right prediction for it. So a group, a group of people sat down and decided to calculate the annual corrections for uh, or the W plus hard radiation. This was Altarelli uh, and collaborators. And they were able to explain exactly the data that has been the events that they have seen experimentally. So the point there is that it was hard radiation that you had to consider, not soft or collinear. So you couldn't use the pattern shower to model them. You had to rely on an actual QCD calculation for that. OK, so that was Rillian yesterday. What are we doing with Rillian today? So one of the important um, quantities that we still care about is the W mass. So it's an important observer in the global fit to electric precision data and the agreement between what you get directly from the measurements and what you get from fits has been used to test the standard model and extensions to the standard model. So up to today, um, the, direct, the most precise direct measurement that we have is actually from Tebatron. The green here is in from CDF. The D0 value is in here. This is the combined value. Mm -hmm. They are the values of the smallest error. LHC has a measurement, but it still does not beat the precision of the Tebatron measurement yet. OK, so um, we, we continuously, we try it always to use uh, fits, indirect fits, and direct measurements for MW. And some of these fits were actually the ones that pointed out to the fact that Higgs is actually light. And eventually, we did discover the Higgs, and it had a light mass. So this is just an example of, of such fits. Here we are looking at um, a plane with the W mass here on the vertical axis, the top mass on the horizontal axis. So the green bands are the measurement. And then you have fits that use uh, mostly lab data, like the forward backward asymmetry in lepton pair production, total hadron cross section, and so on. Uh, the difference between the blue and the gray fit is that the blue fit uses the Higgs mass now as an input. The gray one does not use the Higgs mass as an input. And you can see the impact of that on the, on the fit itself. But the major point here is that the measured values here and um, the fit are consistent. I mean, the fit leads to larger uncertainties, of course, but the, the point is that they overlap. So we have right now good agreement between direct and indirect measurements. So how do we measure the W mass? Um, I don't know if people are familiar here with the Jacobian peak. So. At three level, when you have no additional uh, hadronic radiation, so you have just a W decaying into a lepton neutrino and there is no radiation coming with it, if you calculate the cross section as a function of the PT of the lepton, so d sigma over dPt, you get the result I'm showing here. So you have one coefficient that is totally smooth. This d sigma over d cosine theta is totally smooth. You can write it in terms of spherical harmonics. And you have a term with the square root in the denominator that has 1 minus twice the PT of the lepton over MW squared. Now, if the PT of the lepton hits MW over 2, you can see that you could have a singularity in this denominator. Now, this is an integrable sing singularity. It's not a real singularity. It's an integrable one, so that's important. But if you take this and you plot it, you plot the number of events as a function of the PT of the lepton, you can see that there is a sharp drop at half the W mass. So this is the so-called Jacobian peak. And ideally, you would use it to extract the W mass. You go to the point where you have this sharp drop, and you use that to extract the W mass. So this is the picture at three level. Now, in real life, Ws are produced 
in addition to hadronic with an additional hadronic radiation. Okay? So the PT of the W in real life is not zero, like what you have at three level. There are other things that complicate life. The W has a width. So the W propagator is not just one over P squared minus MW squared, it has a complex piece that is proportional to the width of the W. So in reality, the mass is, is not just one value, it's actually a distribution. So there are various things that, that impact the previous picture. One of them also is the detector smearing. The detector smearing is associated with the fact that we can't measure our energies and momenta precisely experimentally. So that introduces some um, smearing of our distribution. So um, Uri Bauer has back then studied the effect of all these uh, things I have just mentioned. So the black histogram corresponds to what you get once you account for the width of the W. Here we are looking at the PT of the lepton, number of events as a function of the PT of the lepton. So that sharp drop now changes into this distribution that you see in black when you account for the W width. Then when you account for the fact that your PTW is not exactly zero, since you have additional radiation, the distribution changes into this um, plot in here that, that I'm showing with this, uh, um, which one here is it? The red one, it changes into the red one. And then when you account for the detector smearing, nothing changes. So the detector smearing effects do not seem to, to affect the PT of the lepton itself. But the PT of the W corrections do affect the distribution. So then at the end of the day, you have something that looks like this yellow red <coughs> shape. People ask it themselves, OK, is there another distribution that is not so sensitive to the PTW effects? One such case is a transverse mass. This is the definition of the transverse mass. So you do the same exercises that you did before. You introduce first the width of the W that gives you the black curve. You introduce corrections from the PT of the W that gives you this red dot. So the, PT of the, the corrections of PTW do not change things much. But now the detector smearing effects do change our distribution. We get this yellow distribution instead. So MT is sensitive to detector smearing instead effects. So in reality, there is no one perfect variable that is used to try to extract the W mass. They actually use a combination of the transverse mass, the PT of the lepton, and the PT of the neutrino. Because they have different systematic uncertainties, however, they are correlated. And so they use fits for each of these observables and try to get uh, the W mass from there. So you can see that all these effects complicate uh, dealing with the W mass, and so this is why, for example, only last year LHC has produced measurements for the W mass. Uh, so these are from Atlas here, uh, and you can see their uh, error bars are a little bit larger than what you see in, in the Tevatron measurement. However, these ones are going to improve over time. Okay, another modern application is the fact that, you know, all this stuff that we are learning within the standard model about the W mass will eventually uh, be used also for our searches for new physics. So this is a plot, again, of the transverse mass, a uh, number of events as a function of the, of the transverse mass. At the bottom part is data over standard model. So this is a study here of the so-called sequential standard model, where you have a W prime that couples to fermions in a, the same way that, that W is coupled to fermions. So this we have two uh, different masses here, 3.6 TeV and 2.4 TeV for the W prime, and the signals are shown in black and red here. The thing that you can notice immediately is that you have this same structure of the Jacobian peak we have seen for the W earlier on. So all these analysis and studies that we are trying to do within the standard model to understand the W mass could eventually be later on applied to searches for new physics like understanding the mass of the W prime. So Drillian is also important for extracting PDFs. Um, this is an example here of how uh, data coming from um, Tebatron has helped us uh, constrain Bjork and X. So the data here in green comes from the uh, W charge symmetry from CDF. Uh, so there are three types of data points. They have the D0, Z rapidity, CDF, Z rapidity, and CDF, W asymmetry. 
And you can see that they help you constrain the quark PDFs down to values that are almost close to 10 to the power minus 3. Uh, there are other data from other experiments, like the fixed target experiments down here, <coughs> which help you uh, constrain bias of x at higher x, like 10 to the power minus 2, 10 to the power minus 1, relevant for quark and tech quark uh, PDFs at high x. So this radion plays an important role everywhere, basically. This is just to show you that LHC data started to make it uh, into our fits for PDFs. So these are data from CMS for the WS symmetry in blue here. And you can see that they allow you to go down in constraining Björken X close to actually 10 to the power minus 4. So they give you um, constraints on lower values of X than what we have achieved so far. Okay, so Drillian has also in the past been used to get constraints on C quarks. So a while ago, we had no constraints, for example, on, on the ratio d bar over u bar, the C quark ratio d bar over u bar. So this is here plot that shows you um, data points coming from uh, looking at the ratio of the proton deuterium cross section to the proton proton cross section as a function of uh, the momentum fraction of the target quark. So the data points are shown explicitly in here. All the other curves are actually predictions. And they are pre predictions based on different parameterizations for the C quarks. We had no clue how to parameterize them. We didn't know much about them at that point. So for example, here is um, a prediction that uses CTEC PDFs where the assumption was that the D bar and the U bar distributions were the same. And you can see that it's totally off. These are other predictions that use different PDF sets and different parameterizations for D-bar and U-bar. So the fact that we were totally different from data made it clear that you have to include this data set into the fit of PDFs. And this is an example, for example, coming from the CTAC group, where they took this data set here, put it in their fit, and you can see now in this dashed curve that they were able to describe the data at this point, because they were able to get constraints on, on D-bar over U-bar from this data set. So you have better now agreement with data. Question. Yeah. Is, is it not danger? Is there not the danger that one might like hide new physics effects in the PDF? Of course, there is danger of hiding new physics effects in PDFs. Yes, this is a topic of discussion right now. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So we talked about C quarks. This is now valence quarks. We also need to constrain them. So one observable that is used to help constrain the valence quarks is the charge symmetry for the W. So the charge symmetry for the W is actually defined um, in, this, in the way I'm showing here. So it's the difference between the, the cross section d sigma over d y w for the w plus, d sigma over d y w for the w minus, y w is the rapidity of the w, divided by the sum. And this ratio actually can be simplified in some approximations to be written in terms of u over d and d bar over u, the way I'm showing in here. Just to remind you what xa and xb refer to, xa is connected to the exponential of the rapidity of the w times the w mass over square root of s, and xb is proportional to the exponential of minus the rapidity. Now, you want to get the constraint on the u over d. So when you go to, to the very forward region or to very high values of the rapidity, xb goes down, becomes very small, becomes close to zero. And if you go to the previous plot I showed for the d-bar over u-bar, when x goes down to zero, my distribution got becomes, the ratio becomes close to one. Okay? So as x goes to zero, d-bar over u-bar becomes one. So if you use that fact, and you replace d bar over u bar here with 1, you have only something that depends on u over d. And then you can use data associated with the charge asymmetry to get constraints on the valence quarks. Now this is a simplic simplistic picture. It's, it's a rough way that, that we typically use to kind of show you how the constraining is happening in real life. They keep both, fit, b both ratios and they have a more sophisticated way of doing uh, the fit. So just to show you that this, this chart of symmetry is actually data is important in, in improving the PDFs, we can look at this plot here. So we are looking at the W rapidity here, down here. And what they have plotted is the charge asymmetry 
coming from various predictions using different PDF sets, and they subtract from it or normalize it to the charge assembly that you get with NNPDF 2.3. And if we focus on the region of uh, rapidity of W around 1, which is kind of amplified here, what you could see is that even though in the case of red and blue, they, the predictions come from the same tool, the same code, MC at NLO, but using two different PDF sets, you get different predictions. What this tells you is that there is an issue with the PDFs themselves. And what that means is that the charge asymmetry data is important to include in the fit to improve the PDFs. The ZPT also, uh, which you can get if you calculate Z plus J at NNLO, you can calculate ZPT at NNLO uh, immediately. And so now we have those results. Just to show you that they are important for constraining the gluon. So this is here the gluon correlation coefficient as a function of Bjork and X. Um, what you can see is that there is a strong correlation between the ZPT, these are different bins of the ZPT, between the ZPT values and uh, Bjork and X, in particular around values of X Higgs of the order of 0 0.0.01. Those this is an important region. That's the region where we are trying to understand the, the Higgs property bearing. So that tells you that the ZPT data are important in constraining the gluon PDFs. And in fact, we did go ahead and include this uh, ZPT data and the corresponding prediction, which at this point are available at next to next reading order. And you can see clearly that there is an improvement in the uncertainty of the, of the PDFs once you account for the ZPT data. Okay, so my original plan, as I said, was to go through this uh, NLO calculation for Julian, and so I have it here on de in details on the slides. Uh, now this plan has changed. I will just focus more on the physics part, as I said, and I will leave these slides in. They will be posted later on, so you can go through them um, slowly and work the details if you are interested. So this is, it starts with the leading order calculation explicitly. I show you everything here. Um, we go through the same steps we have gone through for E plus E minus two hadrons. Uh, you start always with calculating the phase space, matrix element squared. You put the pieces together, uh, your PDFs. Now you have two hadronic initial states, so you have two PDFs that you have to account for. And then these are the diagrams you have to care about at NLO, virtual and real radiation contribution and they are all explicitly provided um, in these slides. So you can go through them. Calculation is pretty, pretty similar to what we have done for E plus E minus two jets, except that in the end, there will be some uh, counter terms that you have to account for for initial state collinear singularities, and you will have one for each uh, PDF. So here you go, they are all in here. You can look at them later. So future high energy colliders. So you know that there is a growing interest in our HEP community to build a future high energy proton-proton collider uh, with a center of, m of mass energy of the order of uh, 100 TeV. So there are initial discussions regarding where it should be. Should it be at CERN? Should it be in China? Um, and in if this happens, it might be that it comes after an E plus E minus six factory. So discussions are still going here. What I wanted to show you is that such a machine will actually increase our potential of um, understanding uh, drilling and better and probing regions that we cannot access at this point at, at the LHC. So for example, this is a part that is showing you the cross section as a function of the center of mass energy. And if you look at the W and the Z, you can see that they have one of the highest production rates which means that this process will remain a background to our new physics searches. So the continuous understanding of this process is going to be important. You mean it is included in the right? Sorry? It is included in the Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, of course, yeah. But still, it's you are having really large rate in here. If you compare it, for example, to what you get at 14 TeV, it's an order of magnitude larger for the Julian itself, and if you compare it with everything else, it's one of the largest rates. So you need to keep understanding this process as we go uh, forward. 
This is just an example that shows you that, again, a 100 TV collider will open new uh, windows to you. For example, it will allow us to uh, study Bjorken X down to values of the order of 10 to the power minus 6. So that's the reach for um, a 100 TV collider. If you look at a 14 TV collider, that's, again, one order of magnitude better. With the, with the 14 TV collider, wh where, where you are, where is it? The red line, you will be down here, so between 10 to the power minus 5 and 10 to the power minus 4. Here, you can even go past 10 to the power minus 6. So we'll be probing different uh, values of, of Bjorken X. And this is a plot that shows you that we will be able to access uh, mass ranges that are way beyond what the LHC can allow us to do. So here we are looking at various, uh, you know, gauge bosons coming from new physics, uh, Z primes coming from all sorts of models. Solid lines correspond here to the 100 TeV case. Dashed lines cor correspond to the 14 TeV. So at the, at the LHC, you can probe values of such masses up to 7 or 8 TeV. In a, f in a 100 TeV collider, you are going to much higher range. In fact, 35 TeV and above. So you can really, if there is something heavy out there, you're going to see it at such colliders. And that's one of the motivation for building such future colliders. So this is just a recap for Drayan. So it is an important precision tool at Heron Colliders. It is the only process for which we have approached percent level precision at both on the experimental side and on the theory side. It has a proven record for discovery. So you should really appreciate this <laughs> process very well. Uh, we discovered, as I said, the Z, the W, several resonances, and it plays a crucial role in, in uh, constraining the PDFs. So we will continue to play an important role also in future colliders. That's what we have seen so far. Okay, so since some of someone asked me yesterday to just list um, methods for calculating NNLO um, cross-section, in particular the infrared structure of the NNRO cross-sections, after we have seen the yesterday the uh, slicing method that I discussed for NLO. So we'll just go through some of the methods that, are exist that exist in the market. I will just, for explaining, I will just focus on a subset of them. You will see that there is a lot that is being used right now. Okay, so why do we talk about next to next reading order calculations? Well, there is a variety of reasons, and I try to highlight it in here. For example, whenever you have a benchmark process that is measured with high precision, like Drillian, Z plus Jet, you need to push your theory prediction to a comparable level of precision to the experimental data. So this is an example of processes that we understand pretty well on the experimental side right now. Processes that are ba backgrounds to Higgs studies, like Diaboson, or that are used as input into PDFs, they need to be understood pretty well. That's the example, for example, for V plus Jet, or DiJet, or TT bar. <coughs> and whenever you calculate the next leading order cross section and you see that you have large corrections, you do need to go to NNRO to test your perturbative conversions. And Higgs production in gluon fusion is a famous case for that where NLO corrections were so large, we had to go to NNLO to see if we have a convergence in our cross-section or not. And these days, we even have N-cubed LO results for glue glue to Higgs. Okay, so the basic ingredients for getting the next to next reading order cross-sections are shown here. You need the double virtual corrections. You need the one of virtual corrections with an additional radiation and you need pieces with double ray radiation. Each of these pieces has infrared singularities associated with it. In the case of the virtual corrections, you can integrate inclusively over the loop momenta. And if you are working in dimensional regularization like we did in the, in, in the past couple of days, those divergences will immediately manifest themselves as poles in epsilon, like I'm showing you here down. The cases where we have a real radiation involved, however, are more complicated you can't integrate inclusively over your final state because we typically have cats on these final states. We have cats on these uh, radiations. So you can't integrate inclusively. The only int inclusive integration you can do is whenever you have a loop, and that's it. So to extract the corresponding infrared singularities, you need a different, you need a way to do it before you even integrate.
And this has turned out to be quite complicated at the, at the next to next reading order. So people spend quite a bit of time trying to come up with all sorts of uh, ideas, techniques, to see how to do this in the most efficient way and in a most systematic way. And so what you can see from this plot is that so, so early on between 2002 and 2010, we had very few NNNO cross sections that were known. And you can actually count them and read each one of them. And they were all processes without jets in the final state. Jets complicate the infrared structure. At that time, we didn't have uh, a good way of taking care of the associated <coughs> in singularities in a systematic way. So we had only these few cross sections within a decade. So it took a decade to get these results. And then between 2014 or 15 and now, there was an explosion of NNLO results. And that includes processes with jets as well. You see we have Higgs plus jet, W plus jet, Z plus jet. <coughs> Sorry? <laughs> yeah, with, the, with all sorts of people too. I mean, it's, it's a lot of contribution. These groups each is having a different method. So yeah, it's, it's, it was a significant progress. So it really felt like a barrier was broken through. And I will list some of the methods that, we ha that have been used. The reason we have this progress is that we have now multiple methods that can allow us to deal with uh, infra singularities associated with NNLO. We still don't know what's the best, which is why you have all these methods that I'm showing in here. So they fall into two categories. One category is called uh, effective field theory methods. Uh, that's the case of the QT subtraction which is used for processes without jets. And there's the unjetness subtraction, which works for everything, processes with or without jets. So it's more general. And then you have um, the traditional subtraction methods, and that includes sector decomposition, which was used since early 2000, antenna subtraction, sector improved residue subtraction, colorful subtraction, projection to born. So there is a lot. Now, each of these methods works in a different way. And so uh, if you want to understand them, you really have to sit down and read multiple papers before you can really understand or get an idea how these things work. So I will not say anything about the second part. Um, I will describe the first part. Antenna subtraction, if you are interested in it, you have actually one of the experts sitting back there, Stefan Weinziel. He will tell you a lot about antenna subtraction. He has single-handedly calculated E plus C minus two jets at NNLO. So he can tell you everything you want to know about antenna, if you are interested. He used antenna subtraction. All right, so this is just a very generic uh, slide. So the way this second category of subtraction methods work, they construct counter terms that approximate the double real emission and the single real emission in their singular regions in such a way that this difference is finite and when it becomes finite, you can go ahead and integrate it in four dimensions. But those subtraction terms constructed by these different methods have to be simple enough that you can actually integrate them over their corresponding phase space, such that at the end of the day, you manifest the poles from uh, the corresponding real real or real virtual contributions, such that they cancel with the virtual correction. So this sum here is finite. The way these subtraction terms are constructed is a very involved business. And you know, there are methods that constructed analytically, there are methods that constructed numerically, people have different preferences. So I will be focusing, as I said, on the, f the first category of method, EFT-based methods. And I will start by giving you an idea of how QT itself works. So to understand what, how this approach works, actually, we are going to look at Higgs production at next reading order. So at next reading order, you have one real emission. This propagator here can go on shell, and I can parameterize it. So the momentum running here is the sum or different from momentum of PI and PF that I'm denoting in here. And I can actually parameterize it using the PT of the Higgs and the rapidity of the jet. So this is my denominator. EI refers to the energy of the incoming parton. 
the thing you can see explicitly from here is that as long as PT Higgs is finite, I have no singularity in here. This is completely finite if PT Higgs is different from zero. If PT Higgs is zero, however, there is a singularity. So when you have no singularity, this is simply a Born level calculation. It's totally finite. You can go ahead and do it in four dimensions if you wish. Uh, if there is a singularity, you have to think about it. So the fact that there is the PT of the Higgs, you know, you have to distinguish between the zero values and the non-zero values hints to the fact that you could introduce a cutoff on the PT of the Higgs to separate the singular region from the region where things are finite. So your cross-section when you introduce such a cutoff becomes a sum of two pieces. A piece where the PT of the Higgs is below that cutoff, and we will talk about the cutoff now, and a piece where the PT of the Higgs is above the cutoff. And the cutoff is chosen to be small enough such that you do not, so this formula here actually, I will, let me postpone the, that discussion, let's just focus on the important part first. So the, part, the, the piece below the cutoff actually has all the singular contributions, namely contributions where this real radiation is soft. It also has the virtual uh, contribution, just because at the virtual case there is no radiation that the Higgs can record against, so that corresponds to PT Higgs equals zero. So all these contributions that correspond to a small value or vanishing value of PT Higgs are below the cutoff. Everything above the cutoff is finite. And finite means it's a tree level, basically it's a finite tree level calculation, you can just go ahead and do it. This is an x ray in order example, okay? So now the question is how do you get this piece below the cutoff? The interesting thing is that there is a factorization theorem, or a formula, sorry, that was derived for small values of the PT of the Higgs by Colin so Soper Sterman in 1985. So it can give you the cross section in the region that you are interested in right now. And it's a pretty simple formula. It has three functions. A soft function, which is universal in this case. It describes the soft emission. And you have two C functions, which will describe your virtual corrections and your collinear emissions. Now this formula has corrections of the order of the PT cutoff over your hard scale squared. So the cutoff has to be very small in order for you not to have such power corrections. Okay? This is important. So this is why the cutoff has to be very, very small. And so now as long as you know these functions here up to the order that you need, NLO and NLO, you can just go ahead, plug them in and get the cross section below the cutoff. It's a very simple picture. So it's much simpler to calculate these S and C functions than it is to actually deal with the, with, with, with the complexity of NNLO uh, calculations and the complexity of the infrared singularity in the real radiation that comes from other methods, for example. So just keep in mind, we have to make sure that PT cut over M Higgs is very, very small. Now this QT subtraction was not used to get processes with jets. So why is that? You can see that through this NLO example again. Now we are going at Higgs plus jet at NLO. So we have two radiations in our final state. And I'm denoting their momenta by P1 and P2. So now this propagator here can go on shell. And I can parameterize this propagator using the PT1 and PT2. So the corresponding PTs of radiation 1 and radiation 2 as well as the difference in azimuthal angle and pseudo-rapidity. So that's a simple parameterization. You can write it down without any issue. Now, that now the fact that we have other jet has changed everything for us because you can see that if this radiation becomes soft or this radiation becomes soft, this denominator is going to vanish no matter what the value of the PT of the Higgs is. The PT of the Higgs can be finite, yet you will have a singularity. Okay? If these two radiations become collinear, this denominator will vanish. And that is independent on the value of the PT of the Higgs. So when you add jets, the PT does not regulate your singularities anymore. And so PT Higgs no longer resolves singularities in the presence of final state partons. You need a different resolution parameter at this point. 
OK, so that's where the energetiness comes in. So what is this energetiness? It's an event chain variable and is defined in a very simple way. This is the definition. So you take the scalar product of your momenta of the final state partons, that's this QK, with the light-like directions of your initial state beams and final state jets, you minimize with respect to each of these directions, because you're taking the scalar products of all sorts of pattern momenta with each of these hard directions. So with respect to each of them, you're going to look for the minimum. You sum over all patterns in your final state, and you will get something. The something that you will get will be either vanishingly small, and this would only happen if all these scalar products vanish. All the scalar products will vanish if all your radiation is soft and collinear. Or you get something that is not zero, that is greater than zero, which would happen if at least one of these scalar products is different from zero. And what would that mean is that you have at least one resolved radiation, hard and well separated from the rest. OK? So now we again see that there is a difference between the region of very small tau and the region where tau is different from 0. So we can do the exact same thing that we have done with QT subtraction. But before we go there, let me just show you the parameterization of this diagram. So now we can write the propagator in terms of the one jettiness in a very simple way. It becomes now the one jettiness times the energy of the jet. And you can see that the one jettiness now fully controls the singularity structure of this contribution. So all final state singularities are now regulated by just this tau one variable. That's our resolution parameter. So now you just introduce a cutoff on tau to separate this region of very small value or vanishing values of tau of, of the angetiness from the finite values. So again, your cross section now becomes the sum of two pieces, the cross section below the cutoff and the cross section above the cutoff. All the singularities will be in this part. We are talking about NLO here, so all the singularities will be in this part. The other part, because it has one resolved radiation, if you are talking about next reading order, uh, which is the case we are discussing here, the above the cat part, all you need for it is a leading order of your board process plus an additional jet. You understand what I'm saying? Because above the cutoff, you have one resolved radiation. Just by counting powers of alpha s, the only thing that you would need there is just a leading order cross-section for your burn process plus an additional jet. This will be Higgs plus two jets for us, leading order. This is at the next leading order case. When I move to the next to next leading order examples, here, this becomes slightly more complicated. This becomes a next reading order description for your born process plus an additional jet. So you could still have singularities there, but they are next reading order singularities that we know very well how to handle. Do you get the point? I know someone who is implementing it, so I'm pretty sure he's following. If you have any questions, let me know. So this is basically a given piece to you. We know a lot at next reading order. What we don't know yet is how to get the cross section below the cutoff. Well, here again, just like in the QT case, there is a factorization formula that gives you the cross section for uh, very small values of tau n uh, that was derived by these people in 2009. Uh, again, it has a very small number of functions that you have to care about or derive. There is a hard function that describes the hard radiation. There are beam functions that describe radiation collinear to the initial state beams, a soft function that describes soft radiation, and a jet function to describe any radiation collinear to jets. The hard function is process dependent, which means you have to recalculate it from scratch any time you change the process. The beam functions are universal, which means you calculate them once and for all, and then you have them. The jet function is also universal, the soft function is semi-universal, meaning it's the same for all processes with one jet. If I'm interested in two jets, I have to recalculate it. 
because it depends on the hard directions that they have in my problem. So all you have to do at this point is calculate each of these functions at the order you are interested in. If we are interested at NNLO, in NNLO, we need to have each one of them at NNLO. And basically, within the last few years, every single ingredient has become available, in particular for the processes we were interested in, W plus jet, X plus jet, and Z plus jet. So H, B, S, and J that we've seen previously are now all available. The sort function for, for one jet processes only. So now you have all the pieces that you, you need. You know how to handle singularities. Now you just have to go and do your phenomenology. And so one of the processes we have studied using this angetinous method is Z plus jet. And one of the motivation for it was the fact that the theory predictions we had back then were not satisfactory. So we are looking here at an observer that is called HT, which is the scalar sum of jet transverse, transverse momenta. And you can see here that you have the data points here and you have predictions coming from all sorts of sources. Back then, they were known mostly at NLO match it to some pattern shower. Those are the predictions that were used in here. And you can see that some of them undershoot the data and have large uncertainties. Some of the other predictions overshoot the data and have large uncertainties. Some of them seem to do a good job in describing the data, despite the fact that they are leading order and the other two predictions are next leading order. So it's kind of interesting. In any case, since you have different results, which one would you use as your own prediction or as your final prediction? Which one would you rely on? Well, the question is, what does NNLO tell us if we go to the next and next reading order? So, as I said, we use the NJTS to do this, uh, this work. And so this is a comparison with 70 EV data, which were the only available data when we finished this work. So we compared with them. So this is HT on the left uh, compared to CMS the rapidity of the leading jet compared to ATLAS uh, results. And you can see the difference between NLO and NNLO here. Here is NLO. It was totally different from data. This is theory over data in here. When you include the NNLO result, you have full agreement with the data. So you can see the importance of going to the NNLO here. And the same uh, was observed for the ETA jet. There is an improvement in describing this observable when you include the NNLO in comparison to the NLO, although it's not as beautiful as the left side. And this was a comparison to the 13 TEV data that the experimentalists did themselves uh, using our results. And so again, you have predictions coming from different sources and you have different level of describing the data from the different predictions. Uh, the pink ones, which are the NNLO results, you can see that they have very good agreement in here at 13 TeV, in particular when you compare them to the NLO blue results shown in here. This is now a comparison to other tools. This NLO, NNLO is green down here, and you have other predictions coming from, um, in this case, uh, a code called MadGraph AMC at NLO, and they have different so-called merging schemes. And sometimes different merging schemes can give you different predictions. Some knob that you have to tune, and it's a source of uncertainty that you don't have at NNLO, but you can see effects of it when you are at the next reading order where it is used. OK, so one of the other observables you can calculate is the ZPT, as I said originally. And the motivation for that is that experimentally, the level of precision they have is really impressive. So up to 200 GeV, the total theory, the experimental uncertainty is shown in dark blue. And you can see that it's basically at most at level 1% or so. And it's even better as you move to some other regions. So it's an impressive level of precision that we have never achieved before. Now, the interesting thing about this uh, process is the fact that already at leading order, you are sensitive to gluon PDFs. Because your channels are QQ bar and quark gluon. Gluon PDFs play a role in understanding the Higgs properties, as I mentioned earlier. So we can use this precise data together with the precise predictions to improve our knowledge of the gluon PDFs. And that's what we have done. 
So this is a plot that shows you a comparison of CMS on peak data with our predictions. Uh, so red here is NLO, blue is NNLO QCD, green is NNLO QCD plus NLO electrical corrections, and then you have the data. And you can see that in going to NNLO, we, we came very close to the data. Although you can see that the data is consistently somehow higher than the prediction. You can also see that electrical corrections start to have an impact when you go to higher PT values. So around 600 GeV, you can see that they bring the prediction down compared to the pure QCD results. This is why I was saying yesterday that they are quite important when you go to higher kinematic regimes. So as I said, you can see the data is consistently higher. Then we did another exercise. We produced predictions using different PDF sets, ABM uh, 16, MMHT 14, CT 14, and NMPDF 3.0. These were the latest ones that were available. And you can again see that data is somehow consistently higher than all these predictions. So that can be due to two things. Maybe there are missing higher order corrections. So maybe you need to go one order higher even than what we have right now. Or maybe right now these PDFs do not describe the proton structure well. So what happens if we include the PTZ data in them? So that's the thing that we have done. And you can see the comparison to the HERA only baseline fit. Um, so ATV uh, LHC data were included together with the corresponding NNO prediction. And you can see that this is the gluon gluon luminosity. This is the quark gluon luminosity. You can see that the blue, after accounting for the PTZ data, leads to much better um, precision than the, than the green. So the uncertainty went down for the PDFs. And this is observed also on the right-hand side here. So if you look at the cross-section for the gluon gluon fusion and vector boson fusion before including the ZPT data and after including the PTZ data, you can see that the uncertainty went down by 30% when we accounted for this data. So it is important in constraining the gluon PDFs. Yeah. Yes. This is the ZPT spectrum. Well, this is the mix of QC electric in some sense, combined in the factorized way. There's always a question of how do you combine electric corrections with the QCD when we don't have exactly the, the mixed ones. So but this is an approximation for that. Exactly yeah, so it's the uh, combining them in a multiplicative way to mimic for what you don't have. So it's a multiplicative way here. If someone has them exactly, you take them exactly, yeah. You are, you are working on that? OK, good. <laughs> so one day they will be there, you know? <laughs> As I said yesterday, however, that these electrical corrections are not included in the PDFs right now. The reason is, even though, for example, you know them for the ZPT, there are other processes where you don't know them. So when they make their global fit, they omit them everywhere to be consistent. And you could see that they can have an impact on the high PT range. So eventually, you want to have them for all the processes and account for them in the PDFs for all the processes. So that will improve even the precision further. OK, so one other thing that you can do is include the TT bar data in your fit. So this is an exercise that was done also by the NMPDF collaboration in 2017. And you could see a significant reduction of the uncertainty in the HERA uh, baseline fit a significant reduction in the high MX region, which corresponds to the high X region. This is actually amazing. So TT bar has a significant impact in the high X region. And so NIPDF uh, went ahead and included all sorts of um, data from the LHC. Top quark, as I showed on the previous slide, ZPT, as I showed you. And they also included um, inclusive jet data. And they saw that the arrows on the gluon fusion and VBF uh, production modes on from the PDF side go down by a factor of two. So that's a remarkable improvement. So that's all in NMPDF 3.1. And so what they are showing you here is um, a comparison of all the other PDF sets, including the old NMPDF 3.0, to their new result, NMPDF 3.1. So you can see that even the NMPDF error bar, after accounting for all of this, went down by a factor of two 
compared to themselves. And that's for both, gluon fusion and vector boson fusion. And these are the error bars from the other uh, PDF groups. OK, this is one slide I wanted to show you about um, uh, results that were obtained with the QT subtraction method. So this is a calculation that was done for the WZ process at NNLO. Before the NNO results were available, we had just this red prediction in here. And you can see that it was totally different from the data. That the NNLO were calculated using QT subtraction, and the prediction describes data pretty well, as you can see in purple. So matrix uses, uh, or this is one of the processes that is implemented in the so-called matrix. Matrix is a box or a code where you can find all sorts of NNLO results with zero jets in the final state, so zero so called neutral final states. And this is the list of processes that you have in this box for the time being that are public. So if you are looking working on any some anything that requires you to compare with, with uh, any of these predictions, you can you could just use this box. Now, there are other results that are obtained with other methods. I don't know if I should go uh, through any of them. So for example, this is the digit production at NNLO, which is known in the leading color approximation. Um, it is an important process as well. Um, it's used for searching for new physics, measurements of alpha S, determination of high X gluon. And again, here, when you compare what you had at NLO with what you have at NNLO, there is a significant improvement in describing the data at NNLO. There is something here going on. There is some kind of, uh, I mean, within the error bars, everything is fine. But you can see a visible improvement when you go to the NNLO. So this one here uses the antenna subtraction, which I'm sure Stefan would be more than happy to give you all the details about it if you want to. <laughs> right, so I don't know if I should go through any of this pheno. Probably not. Let me just skip to this last uh, slide. So. Future directions or topics that are people really working on right now, this is just a quick highlight or quick summary of what's going on, um, where there is a strong activity uh, by our community. So one of the interesting topics is working on two loop amplitudes for two to three processes. So we want to be able to go beyond the two to two results that we have today. We consider the two to two processes a solved problem because the most interesting processes were calculated. So going to two to three will require you to know two loop amplitudes um, and for such uh, cases. And right now we have initial results for three jet amplitudes that have appeared. Uh, another interesting topic is multi-scale two loop amplitudes with massive internal lines. Some, some of the calculations that were done in the past, they were done in a particular approximation. And so now accounting for the dependence on mass has become important as we move on to more precise LHC data, you have to really account for, uh, for all sorts of, uh, I mean, it's better to have exact calculations. So, for example, Higgs plus jet is known at NNLO right now, but it's known in the infinite top mass limit. And the reason is that the corresponding uh, multi-loop amplitudes are not known exactly with an exact dependence at, at on the top mass at the NNLO level. So recently, results at the NNLO level became available with exact top mass dependence. And we could see that they shift the result by 6 to 8% compared to the infinite top mass limit approximation. So that's one of the reasons why you want to work on improving things like this. Constant it's constant, yes. 6 to 8. That's how they define themselves, 6 to 8%. And it's a constant shift, yes, compared to the approximation that they have. That was one of the approximations used before. Here we go. So there was the so-called FT approximation, where you keep the top mass in the real radiation exactly, and you just calculate the loops by integrating the top mass. And then they compare that result with the exact one. And so the shift with respect to the FT approximation is 6 to 8%. And it's roughly constant, as you said. Well, your, 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 your slides are not full. Sorry? The, your slides are not full. They don't have our work. Oh, <laughs> so. Uh, When did it appear, your work? Um, 2017 and 2018, the beginning. So what was the calculation that you did exactly? It's project for top mass threshold and now, yeah, and now. OK, so are you doing some resummation or? Uh, no. This I is the fixed order calculation. Yeah, this is the fixed order calculation. Yeah, OK. Uh, yeah, you can 
Right, so this is a result from uh, Louisonian collaborators, which is from 2018, actually. So, yeah. They did after you, okay. <laughs> then I apologize. Next time I will put you on the slides. I'm sorry. <laughs> So I was talking about multi-scale two-loop amplitudes, and I said they will be important for uh, understanding processes like Higgs top and vector boson production. And here, new mathematical structures appear beyond the multiple poly logarithms that we are used to. Things that are tough, and people are really trying to find uh, to get some understanding of them. Uh, and so there are also new results at three loops, like the three-loop inclusive gluon fusion production cross-section in terms of elliptic integrals, which are one of the complicated structures people are trying to understand today, are, is now available by Mr. Berger. And there are also some initial N3L or splitting uh, function uh, results, which would be uh, needed for the DIGLAB evolution. So you can see that there is a lot, lot of progress and a lot of effort in improving what needs to be improved. Okay, so uh, that was my last slide. Um, so this is just a quick summary. Precision QCD calculations are becoming ever more important at the LHC program to progress, to go beyond where we are right now. So we have studied the framework in which these predictions are made. Uh, there are two major components we have to focus on, the PDFs and the patterning cross-sections. And I try to give you a flavor of um, how we try to take care of all sorts of issues that appear in each of those. Um, there are various new ideas and tools that have been developed to best describe LHC data. This is, for example, related to the NNLO methods I showed you today. And there will be more exciting developments, I'm pretty sure, that are ahead of us. So stay tuned. Speak up. Uh, there was a numerical calculation done. That's why I said that the numerical calculation, calculation is full top mass. This nine percent corrections to the. So that calculation I showed you by Luizoni yeah, and collaborates with sector. So it's a nu numerical. Yes, that's yeah, sector decomposition. You know, there's a group by Gudrun in Munich. They did it uh, also earlier. I don't think Gudrun was part of that. I yeah, may be wrong. It's a different project, and uh, I think this AFT project they don't account for the full top mass. They have. No, no, no. This is the full. This result I showed is the full top mass result, and it's compared to the FT approximation. It is the full one. That's the latest result, and it's the full one. And I'm not sure Gudrun has done the. I think it's the team from Munich, I believe, but I don't know Gudrun was part of it. But it's something that can be easily checked. Yeah. yeah. So you got it all. You understood it all. All. <laughs> It's very easy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Can you can you comment again? So the end jetting this, there's only one process that is actually uh, sorry. There's only one element that's process independent. Is that? No, that is process dependent. Sorry, it's not just it. one element. It's the hard function that is definitely process dependent, yeah. and the soft function it depends on the number of jets you have in the final state. So the soft function will be the same for say all processes with one jet. If you have processes with two jets, you have to recalculate it. Because it depends on the hard uh, colored partic particles that you have uh, in your process. So when you move to two jets, you have to recalculate it. But then you calculate and use it for all two jet processes. You move to three jets, you have to recalculate it. Mm -hmm. So if you make the connection to Thomas Pesha's lecture, the half function is a matching coefficient from the effective theory to mm -hmm. QCD. Then. The half function is basically your virtual corrections. Yes, and yeah. it's the matching coefficient from get all the effective. Yes, 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 yeah, yeah. I see. So as long as you're at the same hard scale, you can look to a different experiment that has the same number of jets in the final state and use that soft function? The soft function is something you can calculate theoretically. It's totally, uh, I mean, it's calculable and we did it at, uh, for one jet processes. We have a framework for getting it beyond that. So we calculate it using sector decomposition. Um, in principle, the idea is applicable to more jets, but you do have to sit down and, and, and do the calculation. Thank you.